Philippians chapter 1 and verse 12. But I would you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather unto the furtherance of the gospel, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace. And I'd like you to underline this phrase, in all the palace. So that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the palace and in all other places. Then jump down to verse 19, where Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation. And when Paul says, For I know, the Greek is very emphatic. A better translation would be, For I know, I am absolutely certain that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And I would like you to circle or underline the word supply in verse 19. But let's go back up to verse 12 where he says, I would that you should understand, brethren, that the things which happened unto me have fallen out rather under the furtherance of the gospel. You know, it's very interesting about the Apostle Paul. He was very transparent with his people. If Paul went through a difficult time, he didn't hide that. He told them about the high times and he told them about the low times. For instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 8, I'm amazed at the transparency of Paul. Because he writes to the Corinthians and he says, Brethren, I would not have you to be ignorant about the trouble which came to us when we were in Asia. Now, you know, most faith preachers don't talk a lot about their trouble because they don't want to give the perception that they've had trouble. But Paul is very transparent. And when he says, I wouldn't have you to be ignorant about the trouble which came to us when we were in Asia, the word trouble is the Greek word thalipsis. And uh, this word thalipsis described the act of torture. And what they would do is they would take a man, tie him up, lay him on his back, and then they would begin lowering a stone down on top of his body. And they would say to him, repent of your crime. And if he wouldn't repent, they would keep lowering the stone and lowering the stone until finally he could feel the weight of the stone pressing down against his face. And they would say, repent of your crime. And if he wouldn't, they would cut the stone. And when they did, it would fall on his body. And of course, he would be crushed. Well, now they didn't literally do this to Paul, but Paul used that word to describe what he felt in Asia. So when he says, we want you to know about the trouble which came to us, a literal translation would be, we were hard pressed. We were nearly crushed. It was a suffocating experience. And in fact, it was so suffocating, he went on to say that we were pressed out of measure above strength in so much that we despaired of life. And the word despaired in that verse is the Greek word exopereomai. It's where we get the word exasperated. And it literally means to be trapped in a corner. It's the picture of an animal that's trapped and can't get out. And in fact, it was a medical word used in Paul's day to describe an individual on the nerve, on the edge, or in the middle of a nervous collapse. So whatever Paul experienced in Asia, it was suffocating. It was crushing. It was above measure. He felt trapped, pinned in the corner, totally exasperated, on the edge of a total nervous collapse. That is how intense the pressure was. And in fact, it was so bad that in verse 9, he goes on to say the sentence was in and the sentence was death. So as far as Paul was concerned, it didn't look like there was a way for him to get out. But then in verse 10, he says, but all of this happened that we might learn to trust in God and not in ourselves, but in God who delivered us and who will deliver us and who will always deliver us. So it resulted in a deliverance and in a resurrection. So Paul has been in this place many times. And now when we read this verse, in Philippians chapter 1, we find that once again he is in a tight place. Well, he's been there before. It's hard to argue with a man that's had an experience with God. And that's why when you come to verse 9, 19, he says, For I know. 
the Greek word egoida, which means I know, I emphatically know. It's almost as though Paul says, I have been here before, and if I know anything, I know that this, this hellish place that I am in, will result in my salvation, the Greek word sozo, or my deliverance, or Paul is declaring by faith, this is not the end of the road. I am going to get out of this place just like I've gotten out of every place through your prayers and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, let me give you a little testimony. Denise and I have worked hard for 15 years, very hard. And the first 15 years of our ministry, Denise and I never took a vacation. In 15 years, not even a five-day vacation. Now, we preached all over the world, but that's not the same as having a vacation, I guarantee you. When you go to Hawaii for six days, but you preach five of the days that you're there, and you're so busy you never put your foot in the Pacific Ocean, you have not had a vacation. Or when you go to Austria with your family, and they want to go see, you know, where the sound of music was filmed, and you don't have time to do that, and the only thing you have time to do is stop and take one photo of your kids, jump back in the car, and go to the next meeting, that's not a vacation. Well, those were the kind of trips the renters took for 15 years. And it was because the blessings of God had overtaken me. The blessings of God have just overtaken me. I have been running for 15 years to catch up with the blessings of God. Isn't that wonderful? Our ministry in the States was blessed. Our books have been blessed. Do you know in America we've sold more than a million copies of my books? That's amazing. In the Soviet Union, we've distributed more than two million copies of my books. I mean, that is phenomenal to me. God's favor has been on my life. Well, when we moved to the Soviet Union, it was like a dream come true. Because in the first two months that we were there, I did not have a lot of responsibility. And can you imagine? That was seven years ago. We've now been there seven years. So those first two months, we didn't have a lot of responsibility. So we preached in the Bible school, and we had fun. And it was the first time that I had ever been a father to my children. Because I had traveled in the United States. In fact, I traveled so much in the United States that I would compare notes with flight attendants, and usually I put in more annual miles than flight attendants. I was flying about 100,000 miles every year. Now, I'll tell you, you've got to be on a lot of airplanes to do 100,000 miles a year. I was in the top 1% of frequent flyers and averaged 20 airplanes a month. And here's what my life was like. On Saturday, I'd get on a plane, fly to a city. I'd do a meeting on Sunday and Monday get on another plane, fly to another city, do another meeting on Tuesday, get on another plane, fly to another city, do a meeting on Wednesday, get on a plane, fly home on Thursday. Well, we had a ministry, so they needed to see me, so I would work in the office on Thursday afternoon and early Thursday evening. Friday, I would spend some time with Denise and the boys, and then Saturday, I'd get on a plane. And I did that year after year after year. And I want to tell you, you need to pray for people that travel and preach. Because after a while, you become like a zombie. You never know what time period you're in. You can't even remember what state you're in. Even this morning, I was talking to somebody on the telephone. They said, where are you? I said, I don't know where I am. I know who I'm with, but I can't remember where I am. I've been in a different state almost every day this month. Well, after a while, you just forget. And you know what? Hotel rooms, it doesn't matter how expensive they are, they just become another hotel room. And I appreciate the beautiful rooms. But after a while, a $50 room and a $500 room, there's no difference. It's just four walls. It's a television. It might have nicer carpet, but it's the same thing. And really, you're kind of like a... You're like a creature of darkness.
You stay in your room during the day and you come out at night. And I'll tell you something else that's hard. When you spend a month like this traveling by yourself, just going from person to person, church to church, room to room, emotionally, it kind of does some weird things to you because you don't relate to people except in meetings. You go home to your hotel room where it's you and it's the television if you watch television and the telephone and your computer. So your total relationships are with inanimate objects. Then when you come home to your wife and she wants to connect, it's hard to connect because you've not been close to anybody for 30 days. I tell you, it's tough on guys that travel. It really is. It takes a few days to get accustomed to living with somebody. It's the truth. So, usually Denise gets upset with me. Because she's at the airport jumping up and down waiting for Rick to come home and I walk through and I'm just as cold as a fish. <laughs> and I don't mean to be, just haven't been warm with anybody in a long time. Don't know how to do that anymore, have to learn again. Well, we did that for years. And I lived the life of a gypsy. I was a gypsy. And it was kind of funny because when Denise and I traveled on the road together when we were driving, we loved to talk to truck drivers because we were always talking to them about the best routes to take. They traveled, we traveled. Now I find myself talking to flight attendants. And so we did that year after year. So when we moved to the Soviet Union, and my responsibility was to teach the Bible three times a week, it was like a dream. I learned how to be a daddy. And we had such a wonderful time together. And at that time, you couldn't find anything. There was a deficit of everything in the Soviet Union. There was a deficit of milk. You know, you wonder where did the cows go? There was a deficit of eggs. How can you have a deficit of eggs? Suddenly the chickens quit laying eggs. There was a deficit of eggs. There was no milk. There was no flour. There was no sugar. If you could find sugar, you couldn't buy it unless you had a coupon. You couldn't have a coupon unless you had a Soviet passport. There was a deficit of everything. There was a deficit of toilet paper. No one told us. <laughs> well, when you run out of toilet paper and there's none to buy, that's pretty serious. <laughs> we searched for three weeks for toilet paper. And when we finally found it, they must have thought my family had a serious problem <laughs> because I bought every roll of toilet paper in that store. There was a deficit of light bulbs. So the renters are walking around for three weeks with candles at night because there are no light bulbs to buy. There was a deficit of gasoline. The Soviet system had completely collapsed. It was a disaster stranger than any fiction writer could ever write. The only way we got gas for our car was because we knew a guy that filled the Russian army tanks. And so he would siphon some on the side and sell it to us for $5 a gallon, which is expensive, but when that's the only guy in town that's got gas and you've got a car and you live in the country, you'll pay $10 a gallon. And so we were going through all of this, and honest to God, we're having such fun. Every day was a scavenger hunt. <laughs> it was. And then the blessing started again. Television started. And it was like we were doing a double take. Our life was changing so fast. The doors began to open. And before I knew it, we had contracts for 38 million people, then 48 million people, then 60 million people, then 80 million people, then 100 million people. And at one point, we were clear up to 150 million people. But those contracts did not come to me. I had to go to them. Well, back in those days, is it okay if I just give you a little testimony? Back in those days, travel was not so easy. 
because there everything had a deficit. For instance, if you got on an airplane to fly to central Siberia, maybe your plane had enough fuel to take you halfway. But when you got on the plane, they didn't tell you that. <laughs> so you'd fly halfway, they'd land the plane in the middle of nowhere, where you will hope that there is a taxi, and if he has gas in his car, maybe he can take you to the train station if there is a train station. And if there is a train station, maybe you can catch a train close to where you're wanting to go. And if there is a train going close to where you're wanting to go, you hope that after you get there, there's some way to get back home. Every single trip was like that. Every single trip. And at that time, Aeroflot airplanes were just fallen out of the sky. Crash after crash. Do you remember those days about five years ago? I tell you, it was dangerous every time you got on an aerofloat. The system had collapsed, and because of that, there wasn't money to repair the planes, there were no parts to repair the planes, and they just flew the planes regardless of their condition. I read of one man that was in Moscow. He got on his plane, got in his seat, and there was a hole through the side of the fuselage. He could put his arm through the side of the plane. So he called the flight attendant. I read this in the Moscow Times. Called the flight attendant and said, there's a hole in the side of the plane. She said, oh, I'll be back in just a minute. So he thought they were going to evacuate the plane. She came back and gave him a blanket. <laughs> That's what it was like. He'd get on the plane and there'd be you and dogs and goats and all kinds of things. When I flew to Azerbaijan, I stood the whole time. There were no seats. People were standing while that plane was taken off. And so for me to go negotiate for plane, for uh, airtime, that's what I had to travel on. I flew on planes that landed on wrong airports. I have landed on the broken fragments of aircraft that exploded on the runway the day before. That's amazing. When you come and suddenly your plane is bumping up and down as it's going down the runway, you wonder why, and you look at, and there's charred pieces of aircraft everywhere, and you look, and there is the whole tail of an airplane totally blown to bits, charred, and you're going by it as you land. <laughs> we weren't supposed to land on that air airstrip because the thing was all over the, air, the, the landing strip. We just landed on top of it. Planes with bombs. Did I tell that one the last time I was here? Any of you heard my bomb story? <laughs> I was flying to Vorkata, northern Russia. Was in Moscow and I went to Patio Pizza. It's right near the Kremlin. And before I went to the airport, I opened the Moscow Times, an English-speaking newspaper, and there was an article called Aerofloat Stories from Hell. <laughs> and I read it. Well, you should never read airplane disaster stories before you go to the airport. <laughs> but I read it. And it talked about the Aerofloat that exploded over Siberia because the pilot gave his 16-year-old sons flying lessons, and he punched a wrong button. I read about the Aeroflow that's landing gear wouldn't go down, so the flight attendant crawled into the bottom and lubricated it with a can of orange juice and pushed it down. And I read about all the pilots that were taking bribes from the mafia to overload airplanes. And the reason they were doing it is because at that time, pilots were only paid $20 a month. Well, you can't pay your, f feed your family on 20 bucks a month. So they knew that they could crash the plane, but they also knew that if they didn't, they would end up with another 100 bucks. So they were playing Russian roulette with these airplanes. Well, I got on one of those airplanes, and it was overloaded. The pilot had taken a bribe from the mafia, and it was kind of a strange configuration in that plane. All the seats faced forward, except ours. And Andre and I were sitting on the front row where there was a seat, two seats, and a table, and two other seats. Only these two 
parts of the aircraft were like this on both sides of the aisle, the very front of the plane. So from where we were sitting, we could see everything that was happening in the aircraft. So I looked out the window, and two big trucks pull up, and they begin loading the bottom of the plane. Now, I've just read this article about air float stories from hell. They load the bottom of the plane so much that they can't shut the cargo door. So a team comes out who jams the cargo door shut. Then the flight attendant comes on the air and says, I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen, there's not enough room downstairs for all the luggage. If you would please pick up your children and put them in your laps, we're going to put boxes in all the seats where there are children. So now they begin placing boxes in passenger seats, and another truck pulls up. <laughs> now they're carrying boxes down the aisle to the back of the plane, to the tail, where they're stacking boxes all the way up to the top. And remember, from my seat, I can see everything that's happening. Now we can no longer see the tail of the plane. Now they've told everybody to take their luggage out of the overhead compartments and hold it in their laps because they're going to put additional luggage up there in the overhead bins. And so I'm watching all this, and I hear the flight attendant say in Russian to the other flight attendant, I'm getting off this plane. We're going to crash. <laughs> and I turned to Andre and I said, are we going to crash? He said, I think probably so. So I thought, what should I do? So I looked out the window to get my mind off of all this, and when I did, another truck pulled up. <laughs> now they begin loading the aisle of the plane with boxes. <laughs> Finally, when they shut the door, there were boxes all up near the cockpit. There were boxes near the door. And I could hear this flight attendant saying, I'm going to get off this plane. We're going to crash. Well, there were two little ladies across from me who were Russians, and they also heard the flight attendant. One pulled out an icon. Do you know what an icon is? It's an object of worship. She set it on the table, and she began to cross herself. The other one pulled out a bottle of vodka. <laughs> I thought, lady, you can keep that icon, but give me that vodka. And so I shut my eyes. I said, God, you've got to do something. Lord, you've got to do something. And just in a moment, flight attendant comes over to the sound system and says, everybody, off the plane as fast as you can. Somebody has called just now. There is a bomb on this airplane. What I remember, there are boxes in seats, boxes in aisles, boxes by the doors. I mean, everybody was jumping hurdles to get off this airplane. So we get off the plane. They take all the luggage off the plane, search everything. There's no bomb. So now they put us back on the plane, except this time, no excess baggage. Amen. They put me back in my seat, and I looked. And this was like a completely different aircraft, perfectly in order. And as I sat there, I realized a Russian-speaking angel called the airport. <laughs> That's really what I believe. And you know, my team grabbed hands to pray. And that drunk woman with her bottle of vodka slapped me. She said, hit me on the shoulder. She said, you're not praying without us. <laughs> so we join hands, and God is my witness. Simultaneously, people begin to join hands, clear to the back of that plane, and all the way around to the front of the plane, and we thank God that we hadn't been destroyed. Yeah. Glory to God. I could go on and on about aircraft stories. <laughs> I was preaching down in Odessa, which is the southern part of Ukraine. And we broadcast into every city and every village of Ukraine. So I'm known there. And I went to the airport to get on my plane. And the woman sold my seat. There are not names on tickets. They're just numbers. So she sold my seat. 
And when she saw me, she said, oh, you're the one on television. She said, I'm so sorry. I've sold your seat. She said, don't worry. I'll find you a place. <laughs> so she took me and Andre out to the airplane. And lo and behold, she had also sold the seats of 20 other people whom she said, I'll find you a place. So the airport administration came out and said, you can't put 22 more people on this plane. It's already oversold. So the airport administration said no, drove away. She said, get on the plane. And like mindless objects, we just obeyed and walked on the aircraft. <laughs> she said, just find any place to sit. So I opened the door to the cockpit. <laughs> but it was too late because there were two breastfeeding women and their husbands. So I opened the door to the bathroom. You know, there's a chair in there. There was a man reading a book, not going to the bathroom. People were seated on the floor. I went back to the kitchen where the flight attendants were all propped up on top of the stove and the refrigerator with their legs so that they wouldn't fall. Now, I'm the only guy without a seat. Everybody else has found a place to sit. And they all know me from television. I feel like an idiot walking up and down the aisles looking for a place to sit, and they're all looking at me like, <laughs> he's out. So I thought, the closet. So I went to the closet, pulled the curtain back, and it was empty. In the closet were clothes, bushes, like rose bushes that somebody had brought on board. And the whole bottom of the closet was glass mineral bottles. Well, it was the only place to sit. So I carefully lowered myself on top of the mineral bottles. Now, have you ever tried to comfortably sit on a Pepsi bottle? <laughs> With a metal cap? <laughs> After two hours, you need a miracle service. So I'm sitting there trying so carefully, and I keep thinking, what if these bottles break? This could be a very painful experience. In front of me was the fire extinguisher, and when the plane took off, it wasn't screwed in well, so it's going like this. So I put my feet up to hold the fire extinguisher in place, which jams the mineral bottles up into my bottom. And then this Russian man comes up screaming, don't lay on my bushes, don't lay on my bushes. <laughs> then if you can imagine, they had the nerve to sell me a sandwich and then charge me $10 for it. Oh. I mean, I could go on day after day after day. That's what we went through to establish all those TV contracts. Well, at the time, it was a lot of fun. I was having fun. To the Far East to the far north, to the Muslim republics, Moscow. I've been to Moscow 200 times. 200 times going through customs, arguing with them over TV programs, tapes, money, dealing with the mafia, trying to avoid the mafia. On and on and on, people who rob you. Yet if we were gonna establish this network, we had to do it. And at that time, they didn't want to see an associate. They wanted to see this face. I had to be the man. Well, in the middle of all this, the Lord told me to start the church. As if I already didn't have enough to do. Because in addition to all that travel, I had to film those TV programs. So in between planes, I'm in the studio. And the Lord speaks to me and says, you have a responsibility to those that live in your capital city. They watch your program. They know you personally. You're their pastor. Start a church. So in three months, I had 800 people coming to church, which is great, except 95% of them were new believers. I only had five people I could use as leadership. Well, when you've got 800 people and only five people to use as leadership, that's a very serious problem. And the five who were in leadership had grown up Pentecostal, which mean they had traditions not based on the Word of God. For instance, they believed that a woman was not saved the same way a man was saved. <laughs> Amen. 
Now remember, they didn't have a lot of Bibles. Some of them only had a couple pages of the Bible. Well, if all you had was a couple pages of the Bible, and you obeyed those few pages of the Bible, you could come up with some pretty weird stuff. And I don't condemn them for their wrong traditions. In fact, I honor them that anybody would observe it is unbelievable to me. And here's what they believed about a woman's salvation. A man is saved by the blood of Jesus. But Paul wrote that a woman shall be saved in childbearing. It's one of those verses that we wish he would have said a little bit more about. <laughs> and so they concluded that a woman is saved by blood and by having babies. And if a woman does anything to stop having babies then she forfeits her salvation. Well, at first, you know, I wondered why all these Pentecostal families had 15 kids. <laughs> I thought, boy, they love kids. Then I realized the woman didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> so they just kept popping out those babies, one after another, after another, after another. It was a salvation issue. <laughs> they believe a woman can't pray without a head covering. Literally, if she is in a car accident, she's thrown through the window, she's bleeding to death, God will not hear her until she finds her purse, opens it, pulls out her scarf, ties that knot under her chin, and then God will hear her pray. And that's why most Pentecostal ladies never took their head covering off. Not when they go to bed, not when they take a bath. They never take it off because suddenly they're out of relationship with God. My staff, growing up in Pentecostal families, didn't know how to think big. And it used to make me so angry because I'm from Oklahoma, and I believe that as Americans, big is better. Well, they were from the Soviet Union, where if they listened to a radio broadcast, they shut all the windows and all the curtains and sat in the corner of the house where no one could hear them. They did everything small. They had never been allowed to think big. So every time I wanted to do something, they resisted me. Why are we doing this so big? Why are you advertising? Why are you advertising this? I said, because it's free now. But even though it was free, they were not free in their minds. So now I had 800 people, new converts, a staff who believed a woman was saved by having babies, who believed she couldn't be heard unless she had on a head covering, and it was a sin to wear a tie. You know why? Look at it. Can't you figure it out? It points to hell. <laughs> and there's a second reason. Judas hung himself. I'm not kidding. It was a sin. So just getting them to wear a tie. I would go home and I'd say, God, this is hard. Plus, I was preaching in the States all the time, once a year, twice a year. So I get home from the States, then I've got to go to Siberia. Get home from Siberia, then I've got to take care of the TV programs. Get through the TV programs, now I've got to get ready to preach at church. And in between all of that, I've got to be a husband and a father. Plus, Russians don't have any money. So I'm having to believe God for the millions of dollars it requires to pay for all that TV time, to establish a new church, to do everything that we're doing. And you know what happened? I got tired. For the first time in my life, three years ago, I got tired. I'm a renter and I'm a German. And we do not admit it when we get sick or tired. It just doesn't exist in our vocabulary. We're from Dusseldorf. And I got tired. And I didn't want to confess it to God. I didn't want to confess it to Denise. And I didn't want to confess it to me. And because I wouldn't deal with it, I began to slip into a depression. 
I hated that stupid television camera. Just to go down and sit in front of it one more time. One week I did so many programs in my studio, I got sunburned. <laughs> Eight hours a day, five days in a row, I was sunburned by the lights. They were Soviet lights and nobody told us they were sun lamps. <laughs> That's what they use in their TV studios. My eyes were so blind I couldn't see for three days. I thought I had permanently lost my eyesight. So just to go down there and to look into the camera, I had to psych myself up so that when he said, I could say, hi, I'm glad you're here for my program today. It was like pushing through sludge to have the appearance of joy. I didn't want to go to church. I was the pastor. I didn't care if anybody else came either. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Paul was honest. I'm being honest. I didn't want another stinking person to get saved because it was another responsibility. And I didn't want to read my Bible. I've memorized it. Why should I read it? I already knew I was depressed. I knew I'd lost my joy. I already knew that. And I didn't need the Bible to remind me. Denise was already reminding me. <laughs> oh, she'd walk through the house just rejoicing in the Lord, just like always. And it would just make me feel even more condemned. Then I'm laying in bed one Saturday morning, and my kids all walk in. Daddy, we've been talking. And we know what you need to do. We've been praying for you. Daddy, you need to do what you preach. <laughs> Can't you do? You just pull the covers over your head and tell the kids to leave. <laughs> but I couldn't stop because there were commitments. So now it was time for me to go down to Kazakhstan and hold a big meeting. Well, our response from the Muslim states is phenomenal, phenomenal. Thousands of phone calls from Muslims that have been saved watching our TV program. So I went down there to meet them. And I thought that it would be a break, get away from all that responsibility, and maybe I'd rest a little bit. Well, that trip ended up a stop in 10 different cities just to get there. It was horrible. And by the time that I got there, my exhaustion was greater than it had ever been. So I went to the meeting, and there were about 4,000 people in this meeting. In Kazakhstan, in the city of Almaty, there are currently five churches that have 5,000 people in attendance. Isn't that wonderful? So I came in the side door of the church, and when I did, the people stood up and began applauding. And they began waving books, which our ministry had sent to them. Thousands of people waving the books. It was their way of saying, look, 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 look. We wrote to you, and you answered us. We are your friends. So it was time for me to preach. And I came behind the pulpit, and the whole time I preached, there were little Kazakhstan people with their eyes waving at me. Some of them waving their letters at me, crying, because they were finally meeting me in person after I'd taught them for so many years. I was so miserable while I taught. I was so depressed that every time I looked out into a smiling face and I was preaching to them about victory. <laughs> and I'm already feeling like a complete hypocrite because I'm not feeling victory. It's a statement of faith just for me to be standing behind the pulpit. And every time I see them and these smiles and tears running down their face, while I'm preaching to them, a different conversation is going on in my mind. And I'm thinking, if these people had any idea how empty I am, 
they wouldn't have even come here tonight. And as I preached, being so miserable, and they were being so blessed, I thought, how is this possible? That they are so blessed when I am so unblessed. And as I preached, I began to think about Balaam's ass. Now, when you compare yourself to Balaam's ass, you're in serious trouble. Well, the ass was used, but the ass was not blessed. The ass was just used. And excuse me, but while I stood there, I thought, well, that's who I am. I'm the ass that he's using right now. He's used many. Aren't you grateful for that? Oh, thank you, Jesus. I came home from that trip and I said, I've had it. I said, when I begin to think of myself as Balaam's ass, we need a vacation. So we went to Rome. And we were there for five days. That was our first vacation in 15 years. Well, I hired the number one tour guide in the city of Rome for early Christian persecution. Because that's really, that's my specialty. Usually she traveled with 50 PhD students. This week she had me and Denise and our boys. We had her every day for eight hours. She took us places where people don't normally go, told us things that people don't have time to hear. And finally, on the last day, she took us to the prison where Paul wrote the book of Philippians. That was my dream, was to see that prison. Well, Rome is beautiful. The old buildings of Rome, even the prisons of Rome, were beautiful. So I expected that it would be a beautiful, clean prison. And Rome is preserved. Rome is still standing. And so when we came to this prison, I was shocked to see that it was really just a cave holed out of the bottom of the foundation of the palace. And that's why verse 13 is so important. Paul says, so that my bonds in Christ are manifest in all the what? Palace. This prison was literally in the bottom of the palace. And as we begin to step down into this cave, there was such a horrible smell coming out of this cave that I stepped back and I said, what is that smell? She said, oh, you're lucky to be here on a day when you can smell that. I said, why am I lucky? She said, what most people don't know and what you have probably never read in any of your books is when the Apostle Paul was held in this prison, it was the central sewage tank for the city of Rome. And she said, if the temperature and the climate is just right today, you can still smell the sewage from 2,000 years ago. She said, and that's what you smell coming out of this hole. I said, if that's what it smells like today, what did it smell like 2,000 years ago? She said, well, as a matter of fact, most people didn't die here because of persecution or starvation. She said, most people died from the toxins that they breathed in the air. She said, it would be like breathing gas. She said, it killed them. So we went into the prison, and the top floor has now been turned into a Catholic church. But there's a circular set of steps going down into the bottom of the prison, and we walked down into the bottom. And there you can see in the wall the remnants of where the chains used to be. And she began to tell me about this prison where Paul wrote the book of Philippians. She said, well, when you understand that Paul was a short man, and he was, he was probably about five feet tall, maybe a little taller, not much. She said, when you consider the stature of Paul, it is believed that when he was here, he stood in sewage up to his hips. She said, now, he was held here for about two months. Prisoners who were held here had their hands chained to the wall, and they were suspended from those chains the entire times that they were in prison. There were no chairs and there were no beds. And even if there had been, they would have sat in sewage or they would have laid down in sewage. 
She said not only that, the prisoners were held in total darkness. Total darkness. Paul was held here two months. The apostle Peter was once held in the same prison for nine months. In total darkness. It was a miracle that Peter had not gone mad in that darkness. But because Paul was a citizen, he had rights that Peter didn't have. Once a month, once every 30 days, Paul had the right to receive mail, and he had the right to send mail. So there he is standing in total darkness with his hands suspended above his head. Most prisoners became so weary after 30 days they couldn't stand anymore, so they lost the power in their legs and just went limp. Now their body is literally hanging from those chains. The number one thing that killed the prisoners was the smell. The number two thing was when they hung from those chains, the chains would begin to cut into their flesh, and because of the disease in the prison, they would develop limb rot, and they would die from limb rot. So now Paul is hanging from those chains, limp, no circulation in his arms because they've been above his head for 30 days. And suddenly he hears a clang. And it's a Roman guard. The Roman guard is walking down those steps, carrying a candle. He comes slushing through that human sewage as he walks to the Apostle Paul and puts the candle in Paul's face. Now, if you had not seen a light for 30 days... And suddenly a candle was put in your face. It would be an excruciating experience. It would have looked like floodlights right in his face. So now Paul's eyes are trying to acclimate to the light. And in his, as his eyes begin to acclimate, he can see the sewage rats in the bottom of the prison that he's been living with for the past 30 days. The guard unlooses his arms, and his arms fall to the side because there's no circulation in them. The guard hands him a letter. Paul tries to reach out with his arms, but there's no circulation. He tries to take hold of that letter, and now the circulation begins to flow back into his arms. It feels like a million needles are going off in his hands as that blood surges forward. That must have hurt very bad. And he's trying to hold a letter in his hands and trying to read with his eyes that are still not acclimated. And he sees that he has received a letter from the church of Philippi. And in the letter, it says they have sent him an offering. Well, how can you send a man in prison an offering? Because in the Roman system, if you were a prisoner, you had an account. And people could put money in your account so that when you got out of prison, you had something to start your life with. So now they have sent money to the prison. They have put it in Paul's account. And this has thrilled Paul. Not because of the money, but because if they're putting money in his account, it means they are believing with him this is not the end, that he's going to get out. That money meant somebody was standing with him. He wasn't alone. And that's why in chapter 4, he writes about their offering. And notice the wording that he uses in chapter 4. In chapter 4, he says this in verse 15. Verse 14. Notwithstanding, you did well that you did communicate with my affliction. Now, Philippians, you know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again into my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but because I desire fruit that it may abound to your account. Now, keep it in mind, they just put money in his account. He says, in effect, it's being credited to your account. Verse 18. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, a what? An odor of a sweet smell. Now do you see the power of that phrase? He said, compared to what I smell every day of my life, this is the sweetest thing I've smelled in a long time. That offering was like a breath of fresh air. And if you want to know what Paul was doing in the darkness... 
in those 30 days. He could have been complaining. He could have been grumbling. He could have said, dear God, take me home. But look what he did. Look at verse 8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Paul is standing in that darkness, and from his darkness, he writes to free people and says, think on things that are good. Think on things that are pure. If there's anything lovely, if there's anything virtuous, think on these things. So in that darkness, Paul has meditated on the right thing. We know from chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul says, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. In that darkness, he's been reviewing his ministry. He knows that he's never yet finished the task that's been given to him, and therefore he's not finished. He's going to follow after, which means he's believing he's going to get out of that place. And now he receives the offering. It means somebody is believing with him. And do you know what the book of Philippians is called? The epistle of joy. He mentions joy 19 times in four chapters. I rejoiced in the Lord and therein do I rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. This was a man standing in sewage up to his hips who now holds a parchment in one hand, a writing utensil in the other hand. To write that letter with those hands that have had no circulation is like trying to push dead meat. And he's scribbling out on that piece of paper, squinting as he writes, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I rejoice, and therein I will rejoice. You are my crown and my joy. Nineteen times from that place of hell, he writes about joy. But well, we had our picture made in that prison, and it's awful. My face looks like it's as white as this shirt. I look like I've seen a ghost. You know why? When I stood there and saw where he was and what he was enduring, and from that place he wrote 19 times about joy. Why had I lost my joy? I was depressed by my blessings. I had lost my joy due to my blessings. Paul had lost everything and had joy. I said, how did he do this? And the answer is verse 19, chapter 1 and verse 19. For I know, ego oida. Ego means I, oida means I know distinctly. I know, I absolutely know, I'm convinced that this, this situation I am in is going to turn to my deliverance through your prayers. Now he knows someone's agreeing with him. Jesus said, if any of you, two of you shall agree. Now he knows someone's agreeing. He's not alone. Through your prayers and through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Well, the word supply is the word epikoregias. Epi means on behalf of. Koregias describes a choir or a choreography. So you compound the two words together, it means on behalf of the choir. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with this verse. What does a choir have to do with his prison or with this verse? And here's the value of doing word studies. Because when you dig deep into the language, you find out where, word, where they came from and why they were used. And in ancient Greece, there was a choir. And the choir trained and prepared... And when it was time for the show to go on the road, the funds were gone. No money. The show was over. So a rich man came. And he gave a gift on behalf of the choir, the Greek word epikoregias, on behalf of the choir. He gave them a supply. Everybody say supply. 
he gave them a supply. And the supply that he gave was so enormous, they didn't know how to use it. It was more money than they could spend. It was an abnormal inflow of cash. How many of you like to have one of those? It was a gigantic supply. And when they received that supply, that contribution, that supply gave them the power to perform. So now Paul says, I'm at the end of the road again. Here we are. I've been here before. And by experience, I know, I absolutely know that this will turn out for my deliverance because you're praying with me and because it's time to get a new supply. He knows that when he's come to the end, that's when Jesus comes to make a new contribution of the Holy Ghost. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. If you would like to receive more information about Rick Renner Ministries, please visit us at renner.org. Start your day on the path towards success and peace as you discover something new from God's Word with Rick Renner's outstanding devotional, Sparkling Gems from the Greek. You may purchase a copy of Sparkling Gems on our website or check us out on iTunes. Thank you for listening to this message and for partnering with Rick Renner Ministries. With your support, we will continue to teach, strengthen, and rescue lives in need. Together, we can make a difference.